All right, let's get started. Um, this webinar is painting in Photoshop, so basically how to use Photoshop's painting tools. Um, before we get started, I want to give you all a link that you guys are welcome to access and download files from. Uh, in it is the reference image that we'll be painting from, a uh, completed PSD of what we'll be doing today if you want to uh, reference it against it later when you're working on this your own, and then my uh, notes uh, for the workshop. All right, so before we get started in uh, actual Photoshop, I wanna talk about the best way to control uh, your mouse basically in Photoshop when you're painting. And if you don't have the best option, it's not super critical. So like I will be doing today on my tablet. So if we switch to my screen, I can show you kind of the key two different types of tablets out there. And it goes into finer graduation from there, but there's really kind of two big broad categories of it. And give me one more second so I can see the chat and we'll go from there. By the way, as we continue through this, um, go ahead and post uh, any questions that you have in the chat window. Um, and I will respond um, as we go, if it's appropriate at that time. Otherwise, I'll cover everything at the end. So if you have any questions, feel free to uh, post them as we go. So anyway, there's two really kind of big kinds of tablets out there. There's this regular one um, where you'll have a stylus where you've got two buttons on it just like your mouse and then you have a surface that will be analogous to your screen so it'll be mapped to your screen allowing you to control your control your mouse or your paintbrush in photoshop with something much more naturalistic to be painting with um, and then the fancier ones will have a bunch of additional buttons and controls on it and then like halfway decent ones will also have pressure and pressure control which means you can control different things in photoshop based on how hard you're pressing down, which can be really useful. So just like when you're painting, you can kind of change and taper uh, the size of the line you're leaving with the brush, you'll be able to do the same thing uh, with your pen or stylus. On um, the other fancier kind, uh, instead of just having something that is analogous or uh, matches up with your screen, instead is the screen itself and allows you to paint directly on it. Um, and there's lots of articles out there that kind of go over the strengths and weaknesses of the two and what you should really look for uh, when purchasing one. But like the big key is uh, resolution um, and sensitivity. So like the higher resolution it is, this, the more steps there'll be for each movement that you make. Um, and then sensitivity, like how fine of a pressure can it feel and how many steps does it have between your different types of how hard you're pressing down are really like the, the big things that you're going to care a lot about. Anyway, so let's get into Photoshop itself. And we'll switch the screen share just to Photoshop just to make it a little bit easier for you guys to see and you're not having to stare at my uh, chat window. Um, by the way, my name is Rico Fall. I teach art and graphic design over at Iowa Western. And the exercise that we'll be looking at today is actually an exercise from one of my classes um, on Photoshop. All right, so when you first start up Photoshop, um, I'll kind of go through the layout of Photoshop pretty quickly under the assumption that you've at least opened it before. Um, but we'll give you, those of you who are unfamiliar with it, a little bit of enough of a setting to be able to go through it. Over here, when you first open up on the left, you'll have uh, Create New and Open, and then you've got um, Home and Learn. The Learn window is very surprisingly useful and good. Like the tutorials I get posted here are definitely worth looking at. Um, so as you get better or you want more, more information on Photoshop, this is a really good spot to start, actually. Um, for us, we're going to start with uh, Create New. So instead of doing the normal thing in Photoshop where you edit a picture, we're going to make one from scratch. So when you create new, you get um, basically all your recent sizes that you've ever used, your saved ones, your photo sizes, and web, and so on. So like they're presets um, that you are welcome to you know, rely on and use. Um, for us, we're going to actually look at setting this up over here, so we'll, we won't use a preset really. Um, so over here on the right, we have all the controls that we can have for each individual part of the image creation process. So we can go ahead and put in a title. So like I would label this a uh, drawing exercise or, you know, whatever gives you a giggle. Uh, next, we can change the uh, units for the image. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop down to inches just because that's kind of easier for me to visualize this. Um, however, if you're gonna be outputting, like I always have in my head that I'm outputting to a print, um, but if you're gonna be outputting to a web, a pixel size would actually be better. 
Um, so like if you're just making like a quick sketch for the internet, you know, 1200, 1500 pixels will be plenty in size. Um, but it, to print that, you would actually end up with quite a small picture, you know, like three or four inches. So I usually like to default to inches so I know about how big it's gonna be. Um, for today, I'm gonna go ahead and put in 14 inches for the width, and then I'm going to put in 11 inches for the height. And you see that it'll already switch this uh, orientation thing for me. Artboards is if I wanna have more than one workspace, paintable space in Photoshop open at a time. Um, Photoshop isn't super great for this. Uh, Illustrator's got this a lot better implemented. Um, and honestly, like there's not a huge reason not to just have to have multiple artboards open in Photoshop unless you're doing certain things. For us, we just, just one artboard will be fine. Resolution, since I'm going to be, since I have printing in mind, I'm going to set this to 300, which is the easiest rule. Like if you are going to print it, you put it at 300. Um, if you're going to put it on the internet, the old rule was, um, 72. Um, but that, that rule doesn't really matter very much anymore. So the, the really key time that you're going to care about resolution is, um, printing. Color mode, we've got, um, a couple of color modes in here. So like grayscale, if you only want to have access to black and white, um, RGB color is the one we'll be working in, um, CMYK color, if you're going to be outputting this to like commercial printing. So this is like what you would normally see, like a brochure or a textbook printed in, and not like a fine art print in a gallery. Um, and then lab color, if you really, really just need perfect numerical precise control of color. And then it also changes um, the layout of the color channels as well. We're not, it's, it's pretty advanced stuff, so we won't really be messing with that. So we'll be in RGB. Um, bit depth, this is where you kind of have to make a choice. If you've got a lower powered computer, I would go ahead and stay in 8-bit. If you've got one that's a little bit beefier, pop, pop yourself up into 16-bit and you'll have a little bit better of a time in this exercise. Um, the big difference is, is how many steps, just kind of like we were talking about with sensitivity on your uh, drawing pad, um, how many steps you have um, for color and uh, for color depth, basically. So for smoother tones, you want more bit depth. But that isn't to say that we want to pump up to 32, because a lot of tools in Photoshop don't work in 32. And honestly, 16 is going to be good enough is just going to be good enough. You don't, we don't, you don't really need to worry about 32. So just pump yourself down to 16. Um, background content, white is fine. And then color profile. If you're going on the internet, sRGB. If you're going to be printing it, go ahead and drop yourself down into Adobe RGB. If you really start getting into Photoshop, you'll have to get more into color management. This is called a color, prof color profile. Um, and basically, it's just how the range of colors that are going to be available. Um, for you to work with. And Adobe RGB matches up with what most printers can, what most high-end printers can make-ish, like it can contain it all. Um, so Adobe RGB is a really good bet. sRGB, you can end up with kind of lower saturated looking images, but the beauty of sRGB is that everyone's screen can see those colors. So like this is where like you've got an iPhone and an old Windows computer and you look at your pictures on them, they don't look the same. So sRGB, if you want to try to get everything to look the same, Adobe RGB, if you're going to print. Um, and then go ahead and click create. Again, if I'm going too fast or if you have any questions, please go ahead and uh, enter them into chat and we'll, I'll cover them as uh, I can and we go. Um, so first things first, we first pop into Photoshop is we're going to want to enter painting mode. And what painting mode does is it's just going to relay out um, Photoshop a little bit. It's gonna bring certain tools to the forefront and open up certain panels for me that you generally always want when you're painting in Photoshop. And to do that, we'll click on this rectangle over here in the top right of the screen. Um, this, by the way, if you've been to my previous workshops, the reason why I haven't made my mouse giant this time is because when we actually start painting, a giant mouse causes a lot of problems. So anyway, you can click on this and you'll notice there's essentials, 3D painting and so on. You want to pick painting. And you know, there'll be a little bit of a layout change. Um, Anything we want to, I'm not going to really be using the clone source tool today. So I'm going to go ahead and right click on where it says the clone source right here. I'm going to right click on that and say close. Um, let's take a look, tool presets. I'm not going to be really using tool presets. So I'm going to go ahead and close that. And I'm not going to be using library. So I'm going to right click and close on that. And all I'm doing right now is just kind of cleaning up this workspace. So it's a little bit easier for me to move through and do things in it. Um, 
So also over here, we have our history panel, which you'll notice that every time we make an adjustment, there'll be a little drop down in it. Brush settings, once we start using our brushes to paint, this thing is gonna become very important. And then our brush shapes, more on that a little bit later. Navigator for moving around. And then layers, which is also gonna be very important. And we'll kind of cover that as we get a little bit further along. Over on the left, we're gonna have all of our tools. Um, whenever you click on a tool, you'll notice that the options bar for that tool will change. Um, so just keep in mind that you have some controls here. Um, when you have a certain type of tool open and there's a related panel for it, you'll have even more control of it over here usually. Um, Mixer Brush is an interesting example because you've got all that control up here. And then you also access some of the controls by right clicking. Um, that's going to be different for each one of these tools, what you get for right clicking and what's going on across here on the top. So what we're gonna be painting today is a very quick um, orb exercise. So like you take any sort of drawing or painting course um, that does traditional media, you'll be painting an orb. So let's paint an orb in Photoshop and kind of look at how that's different, how that's the same um, with a traditional media. Um, so you've got really two big options. One, you can open it up as a split screen or you can drop it directly into this file um, to look at it. I like to usually for these, just because I don't want to trace as much, um, open it up as a separate reference. So if I wanted to do that, I'll go to file, I'll go to open, and then this will be in um, that folder that I gave you guys to download if you're following along. Excuse me while I navigate to it. And I'm gonna open up reference image one. So, you know, nice little orb right there. Entertainingly, that's a uh, Teflon ball from a large uh, one-way valve for a machine. Fun stuff. So anyway, um, but now it's opened up here and I can't see my canvas because my canvas is actually in another tab. So I've got them right, you know, not super useful. So if I want to access, if I want to see them both at the same time, I have to change my window layout. So if I come up to window and I go to arrange and I'm gonna do uh, two up horizontal, it will put my two images um, next to each other in uh, Photoshop for me to reference. And I can change the window size. Oop, that pulled it out. This part's always a little fussy. You can change the window size by mousing in between them. There it is. And shrinking it down. And actually I want this one on top. So let's go back, view, range, two up horizontal. Well, you're gonna be a butt today, Photoshop. Um, so you can drag this down, and then I'm going to click right here where it says 25 in the bottom left. Um, and I can put in a smaller percent, like 10%, or I could click on the magnifying glass tool and do like um, fit screen, which would be right here, but the zoom drop down blocked it for me for a second. Uh, it's not going to fit it correctly. Yeah, so I'll zoom out. So you can hold down the Alt key to zoom out. You can also zoom out by clicking and dragging up here, but you can see the image down here and then you have your uh, canvas up here to uh, begin working with. So it's just, you can see them at the same time. Now, if this isn't your bag and you want them together in Photoshop next to each other, I mean, not next to each other like this, but in the same file, this is where you would go to file, um, placed embedded or placed link. Embedded means that it's in this Photoshop file, so if you move the Photoshop file later, it stays with it. Linked refers to a spot on your computer, so if you move one or the other, uh, Photoshop won't be able to find that file anymore when you open up your painting. Um, but it also makes for much smaller file sizes, so which one you do is kind of up to you. Um, you could also make the other window active and literally just drag the layer up um, and drop it in. And if you get a bunch of warnings, just click through them. Um, and you can see in this case that the, res the resolution of this picture is quite a bit bigger than this one, so I'd have to shrink it down. Um, but for us, I'm gonna keep with this split screen, so I don't necessarily want um, to trace. All right, so before we even get to the brush, let's talk about how um, colors and all that other stuff are laid out in Photoshop. So, Surprisingly, um, Photoshop when you're in painting mode doesn't just straight up give you um, the most useful thing for painting in Photoshop, which is access to swatches. So I'm gonna come up here and come up to window, and I'm gonna come down to uh, swatches. And what swatches are, and I'm gonna go ahead and drag this, I'm gonna click on the panel, here, let me drag that out again. So I'm gonna click on the panel label, 
and I'm going to hold it in between uh, brushes and history so I get that blue line and release and it will drop it in there. And all swatches are, are pre-set up colors for you to use and access with any of your tools that are going to give color to the screen or, you know, black and white and gray and so on. And so across the, the very first part of it will be all the different colors. And then when you scroll down, you'll get to different um, groupings of color. Um, and so what's important to note about this is that you'll see that there's RGB color, which is um, the RGB color model. And if you are used to traditional color blending, um, this isn't useful. So RGB is using red, green, blue to generate all the colors rather than the primary colors that you would have learned back in grade school, uh, red, blue, yellow. You, yeah, red, blue, yellow. My brain is farting there for a second. Um, CMYK is for is mixing all the colors using cyan, magenta, yellow, and K for black. Um, again, not super useful for us. And so if we want to access the way that many of us learned how to um, create uh, paintings, you have to scroll all the way down and you get red, blue, yellow color. So if you're going to do colors, here's your access to them. And I would go ahead and sample from these ones and use these ones rather than trying to math it out in one of the other color picker tools, um, just, just because you, it just doesn't work out. Like it's frustrating because it's red, blue, green, and you're like, I should be able to mix all these using proportional math, but it doesn't work out. You know, sad, sad panda times. Um, for us, let's take a look at this grayscale. So in the example image I've got on there, there is a full scale for you guys to go ahead and create. And so how you create um, the scale um, is you can select one of these colors. So here we've got um, black. And by the way, if you want to see like a label for these, which I think might be useful for us, we can click on this options thing right here. It looks like a series of lines in the top right of swatches. And we can actually switch the way that this looks. And I'm going to switch to large list. And now it's going to have a label next to every one of these colors. I'm scroll right back down to the groupings. And here is, you know, all those grayscales marked out based on percent, um, which makes it easier to talk about which one we're accessing. So if I click on black, it's going to change my color over here on the left, my active color, the one that all of my tools will be using. And I can click on the shape tool. So just real quick, um, draw in um, a square. So I'm going to cancel for a second. So I can click once rather than click and draw. And I have a width and a height. So I'll type in one space IN for inches. And then you can hit tab or you can click on the other box and click, type in one space IN and click OK. And you'll make a one inch cube. Pretty nice, right? So if I wanted to go through and do all of these, you know, theoretically, I could spend the time to, uh, you know, sample color, click in, sample color, click in, but there's a, there's a faster way to do it. So a tool that you can use to move stuff around in Photoshop is the move tool. So if I click on the move tool and I click on this shape, I can move it around. You can see that the shape even appears down here in my layers. And if I want to very quickly duplicate a shape that I'm going to use, I can hold down the Alt Option key on my keyboard and notice how my mouse changes its appearance. And I can just drag over. And if you, do, you should see these little purple lines appear and it should snap into place. If it doesn't, come up to view and turn on snap. And then go to snap to and make sure all of these are turned on. And it will do that same snapping thing. So let's make a quick grayscale. So I've got black. This one I'll turn into 10% in a minute. So I'm gonna hold down the Alt key and drag over. I'll turn this one into 20%. So Alt key, drag over. That'll be 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. And then I'm gonna go ahead and make 100. It's gonna be white, because I'm gonna be blending from that, even though I won't actually be able to see this square in a minute. Now, if we come back over here and look at our layers, you'll notice that we have an individual layer for each one of these. Um, so like if I click on the layer, I can select you know, individual layers that way, or I can select the shape by clicking on it. So I'm going to click to where I think my second box is, and I'll click 10%. You'll notice that the box lightens up. And if you don't see it lightening, um, it's probably just an uh, artifact of sending the video over. It's losing some bit depth. And I'll click on the one next to it again, go up to 20. I'll click on this one and go up to 30. I'll click on this one and go up to 40, 
50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and then 100 we won't be able to see because it's white. So here they all are. Now, right now when you use any of these shape tools, like if I click and hold on this rectangle, we can see that there's a bunch of really useful, you know, standard shapes in here, right? Um, but right now I can't change them at all because they're shapes. And by being shapes, I can like change their size and color in these quick little clicks. But I can't, you know, blend this into a nice grayscale and I can't pull stuff out of it. I can't, you know, draw on it basically. And so I need to do something called rasterizing to make these shapes editable. So to keep my life easy, I'm going to come over here to my um, uh, layers and I'm going to click on this top layer. So it should be labeled something like rectangle one copy 10. And then if I scroll down to the bottom and hold down the shift key, I can select all of those layers at once. And I'll know I have them all selected because they'll end up being blue outline over here on my screen. Then I can either merge them or rasterize them. And what rasterize means is that I'll be able to edit it with a brush tool. So I can come up to layer and I can do uh, rasterize layers or I can just merge them together, which will also rasterize them. So if I go to layer and I'm going to do merge shapes, command E for the ones I've got selected, it will whoop, maybe I have to rasterize it first. Sometimes they change stuff on you. Yeah, let's rasterize it first. So rasterize layers. And then I'm, I'm, I am going to merge the shape. So I'll go to merge layers. Not sure they can see that in the top row. I'm not sure what you mean by top row. Anyway, so we have them all laid out right here, creating a nice box grayscale. Um, and we're going to blend all these together in a minute. So instead of blending this particular one together, why don't we duplicate it again? So I'm going to grab the move tool, this top left tool right here, and I'm going to alt click and drag up this gradient and then release. So I know I've got two of these gradients next to each other. And in a second, when I come through to blend these together, I can reference this one um, to see my placement and see if it looks good. So how do we blend? in uh, Photoshop. So let's talk about our brushes. So to talk about my brushes, and you don't have to do this part if you don't want to, because I'm going to undo everything I'm about to do. Um, I'm going to make a new layer by clicking the new layer button in the bottom right next to where it, there's the trash can. And I'm going to show you guys these brushes. So over here on the left, we have the regular brush. And what the regular brush does is it allows me to just lay down quick tone. And like if I pick a different brush shape, more on that in a second, you know, I can change the shape of the brush, but there isn't any blending or anything like that going on. Similarly, I have the pencil tool, it's the same kind of idea. And I also have um, the mixer brush. So the mixer brush is gonna be our main blender. So if you click on mixer brush, we get all these ridiculous controls up here across the top. So let's take a little quick rundown of what each one of these are. So if I click right here, it says 13, um, you'll see that I get access to um, my brushes tab, which is closed right now. Let me open that back up, my brush settings. So this is the same as this, which is the same as right clicking. So it's just another way of accessing this menu because it's a menu that you'll use a lot. Um, here is going to be what color you are currently using. And this is going to be a little bit more special than what we have loaded right here in our foreground background colors, because it's also going to preview what's ever mixed up on our brush. Um, next, we have a way of turning on and off whether or not the brush gets loaded. So the easiest way to think about the mixer brush tool is that it's just like painting in oils. So if I want to, every time I release my button on my mouse to you know, theoretically, I've gone back to my palette and picked up paint. I'll leave this highlighted like it is. Now, if I want to pick up my brush and move it without going back to the palette and reloading it, I'll leave this, I'll, I'll click this off like that. So you can see that it empties it out. Same thing, we have clean brush after um, every click. So like if I want to not have any of the paint that I've picked up from the canvas on my brush, um, stay on my brush, I'll leave this off. 
I'll leave this clicked on, but if I want to keep that mix that's on my brush, I want to click it off. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. Um, right here it says custom. These are different setups for the brushes. Um, so like if I click on dry and I just start, let me make my mouse, let me make that a little bit bigger. So I'm going to right click and I'll go up to like a 90. So it's a big, nice line. So, you know, I draw on here. Um, you'll notice that if I draw long enough, I run out of paint because I'm painting on a dry canvas. So like if this was a Bob Ross scene, I have loaded black paint up onto my brush and you know, where he like paints the background in liquid white. In this case, he's like, this would be like if he let the liquid light uh, dry out. Um, so he's painting on a dry canvas with a wet brush, so it runs out. Now if I go down to wet, what this is going to be like is if I'm painting on a wet canvas. So I'm gonna turn on sample all layers so this works better, but I'll tell you what, this, what that's doing in a second. And so like this is as if I was Bob Ross and I'm painting on uh, one of his canvases that have liquid white, and you'll notice that it's picking up and mixing with the background. Similarly, it means that if I paint over an area that I've painted before, it will mix that all together. So it's a way of being able to mix with whatever is on the canvas. Now, like I was talking about earlier, I can turn off load brush and instead of reapplying tone, I can just use this brush to start mixing or I can also pick up tone by turning this guy off. And that way when I paint, you'll notice that a bunch of tone gets loaded up from where I've been painting on the screen, which I can then transfer over to another area or continue to blend with. So that's where these two become very, very important. And so what this is is a balance between wetness, how much pigment is it going to pick up from the background canvas or the layer, um, load, how much paint is actually on your brush, um, mix, which is the rate of mixing between your brush and the background. So if you're very familiar with painting, this would be like how um, thin of a paint is on your brush versus how thick of a paint is on your canvas. So like the thicker, the, the thinner the paint, um, the more readily it will sit on the paint underneath it and mix. Um, flow is the rate that uh, material will be placed from your brush onto the canvas. And then we've got some very special controls. So uh, this is an airbrush. So what airbrush means is if I click on airbrush and I click and hold, it will continue, let's do it with black so it's a little bit easier to see. Um, yeah, there we go. And you'll notice that it starts building up to true black in this case. Um, so that's all airbrush does is it's just like using a real airbrush or a spray can. If you start spraying, there's only a little bit of pigment there and then it can build up. So if you want to kind of mimic that, you can use the airbrush. And then we have something that's very handy for us, which is called smoothing. So if I turn smoothing all the way up and I click and drag, you'll notice that my mouse is going, my paint line is going to fall behind my mouse. And so all smoothing is doing is smoothing out my brush stroke. And it does that by kind of making it drag and follow behind. So like if you're having a hard time having a steady hand or you're doing particularly, you know, a, a large smooth curve, turning on smoothing much further up than the base 10% um, can be very useful. Um, don't worry about these ones. Um, sample all layers. So if you want to only access the layer that you're currently on, you turn this off. So like now when I paint on here, it's not going to pick up that background as if it was liquid white. But if I want to access um, that background tone, I would turn back on sample all layers. So it's a way of saying I only want to access what's on the layer that's active, so the one right now, or I want to be able to blend with the layers that are underneath it. Then we also have pressure sensitivity. So those of us uh, using um, a tablet can turn on pressure sensitivity. So I will, and I'll pull up my hand to tablet. And let's make my mouse big so it's easy to see. Um, now when I drag across the screen, I can start off very small by pressing lightly. And when I start pressing down harder, I start getting a bigger, thicker line. So this is one of the advantages of using a, um, tablet over uh, a mouse. Oh, well, that said mouse, mice are fine. Uh, that, although I wouldn't try to do this with a trackpad. Doing this with a trackpad would be um, an exercise in uh, irritation. 
All right, so I'm going to delete this layer that I made for showing you guys how all that works. I'm just going to come over here and click the delete icon, put this layer active, Oop. and it'll ask me, do I really want to delete it? And I'll say yes. All right, so now I have this little gradient that I want to blend. So I'm going to go ahead and select the mixer brush, and let's go ahead and pull one of these uh, brushes out of um, our brushes tab. So I'll come into wet media brushes. I can open it up by clicking this carrot to open it up and close it down. And if yours doesn't look like this, um, click on this icon in the top right and you know do show brush name, show brush drug. You know I'm gonna also do br show brush tip because that's how I know a lot of my brushes is based on the tip appearance. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and pick a wet blender and let's start blending these guys together. I'm gonna do a little bit bigger of a brush, uh, maybe about 75. And again, to get this window open, I just simply right click, and then I hit enter to accept that type in for the 75. Um, so let's look at uh, blending. So I'll take my mouse and I'm just gonna go over uh, this line and I'm gonna make sure sample all layers is off. And I'm gonna turn on pressure sensitivity for me because I do have, a can do have one of these guys going. And I'm just gonna draw you know, a little circle. And so you see how like I'm picking up some whiteness from the background, so I can just drag down um, to kind of darken that area out. Little circle and little circle. And I can start blending out. You know, I'm going to hide this background layer for a second, so it's a little bit easier for me to see what's going on. So I'm just dragging over from the left, dragging over from the right, little circles until I get it blended to how, you know, it seems nice and smooth to me. And then I can come over to the next one. I'm going to do the same thing. We little circles, we little circles, we little circles, we little circles, and then maybe a little bit of back and forth to really start hiding those edges. And you can keep, I'll, I'm not going to make you sit here and watch me do this whole thing. Um, so the concept is pretty basic, you know, we little circles over this edge. And just like magic, it will start blending, right? Pretty neat. Now, if I didn't use Kyle's wet paintbrush, let's say I was using a regular one, so like if I click on this 30 right here, um, is there a better 30? Yeah, let's use the 30 next to it because it's a little bit denser. Um, make the brush size a little bit bigger, I'd say about 55. Um, and I start trying to, ooh, that's actually the smudge tool, look at that. Well, let's just pick a regular brush it. let's keep this easy. Come up to general brushes, and pick hard round, and yeah, there we go, hard round. And we'll go to mixer brush, hard round, there we go. And we'll make you smaller, so I right clicked again down to 50. So if, in order for me to blend this, I need to turn off certain things. Like right now, I'm just putting down black tone, right? So if I wanted to just blend this with the mixer brush, I would need to turn off, I would need to turn on I would need to turn off load brush and turn on clean brush and I'll set this to wet heavy mix and I'll just come over that same area and start drawing again little circles to do that mixing. Picking up from the background, turn off sample all layers, off. And then you can start drawing in, you can start blending using that same idea. And Kyle's wet mixing brush is very good um, so it's a lot easier to blend with than with the simple round. But the key to blending without that simple, the key to blending without Kyle's brush is that you have it set to not load your brush, set to clean after every stroke, and then you know set it to actually mix mode, and you can start, you know, blending this stuff together. So whatever method you want, I would go through and blend all this together. Also, notice I'm not really caring that if I go off the edge, right? But if let's say I want you know a nice hard edge, how do I get an attractive hard edge on this? So let's take a look at a little cheat. So I'm going to turn on that layer I disappeared earlier, and I want to get a nice hard edge. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on that other that original gradient layer, and then if I hold down the command or I'm not sure what it is on Windows, maybe Control, and I click on this layer thumbnail right here, it'll add that whole layer's content, so in, that, in this case that gradient, to a selection. I'm going to click 
on my layer that I was blending. I'm going to click the layer mask button, which is next to where it says FX. It looks like a rectangle with a circle in it. And it's going to turn that selection into a layer mask. And what it's going to do is it's going to mask out everything that wasn't where that selection was. And so we can see where that is on this layer mask. We've got that white bar. We need to move that white bar up so we can actually see what we're blending. So right now, if I try to click on the move tool and drag up, um, let me turn off auto select. If I click on the move tool, turn off auto select and drag up, there we go. You know, it, it move, I can't, it's not working. Even if I have this layer mask selected and I drag up, it doesn't work. So what I need to do is I need to turn off this lock between the layer mask and the layer. And now when I drag up, it reveals the layer. And now I've got a nice clean edge. And we're actually going to use this same idea in a second um, for this circle. All right. So, you know, we've got a little bit of handling on blending. So let's look at how you would actually paint something like this circle. So what's cool about this circle, and let me just blow it up for a second so it's easier for us to, um, let's take a look at it real quick. So to paint this circle, what we're going to do is we're going to split up this image into three different layers. We're going to have a circle layer, we're going to have a background, we're going to have a foreground layer, and we're going to have a background layer. And by splitting all of them up into their own layers, it's going to be way, way, way easier to paint this image because then I can use a nice little layer mask to get a nice crisp edge for the circle. I can use a nice little layer mask to get a crisp edge right there for the back of the table. And then I can blend the table all I want and the sphere all I want without having to worry about bleeding over into other areas. So let's take a look at how to do that. So again, to get this back into two window mode, go up to window, I go to arrange and I go up to two up horizontal. And then I'm going to zoom out on that. And I can zoom out on this all sorts of ways. So I'm going to click and drag right there in my navigator to also zoom out. And I'm going to mouse in between and drag up. So I have more room and yeah, let's shrink you back down. All right, so let's split up our three, let's do our three layers. So I'm gonna click back into my exercise to make it active. And I'm gonna click this new layer button three times, one, two, three. And which layer I make which is it's really easy to think of this. Whatever is closest to you should be on top and whatever is furthest away from you should be on the bottom. So this top layer will be uh, my orb. The layer underneath it will be my uh, foreground table. And this one will be my uh, black background. And you know what, just to be consistent, oops, Mr. D. I'm gonna label my orb subject as well, just because you know that's what it is, subject. All right, so to make my black background, I'm gonna go ahead and grab that uh, black square tool again, and I'm just gonna click and drag, you know, a big black rectangle on here, basically. Come on, you can lock into place. Yeah, there we go. There we go. So now I've got my black background. Cool, all right, let's click on my foreground table. And to start doing my table, I'm just gonna really quickly block in those colors with the regular paintbrush tool. So let me right click and get a bigger brush. And then I'm going to click the eyedropper tool. And with the eyedropper tool, I can pull off any color that I've got active down on my canvas. Or I could always come up to, if I wanted to, um, my color swatches and pull out one of my color swatches as well to access my tones. Um, in this case, I'm gonna use the eyedropper because it's nice to see how it works. So, you know, I can see about that tone, and you know, I could actually click up here and you can see how it's changing the color. I can actually click on it to grab those tones. You can also click down here to grab a similar tone, whichever way you want to do it. Uh, eyeballing it, that looks pretty good. Now I'll switch back to my brush. I'm going to make sure my foreground table is active and I'm just going to real quickly and lazily, let's get even a bigger brush, block in some table. You know what, let's also switch to a hard round brush over here under general brushes. That'll be a little bit easier for us. Hard round brush. And I'm gonna go over to sample tool. Where are you, Mr. Sample Tool? And I'll pick a lighter color, cause you know, there's some lighter colors in here. And I'll, you know, real quick block this in. And the idea of blocking this in is that in a, few, in a minute or two, I'm gonna blend it all together. 
So I grab the sample tool and grab a nice light color and you know, a little bit of lightness right there. And I'll do the black later with the mixer brush. Um, now, how do I get this to look way cleaner? Well, let's do that trick again. So I'm gonna command click on this black background layer thumbnail. Oop, it's now selected. I'm going to then make sure my foreground table is active. And actually, before we make it, before we click layer mask, so we'll make sure it's active. So we've got a selection that looks like this. And I'll switch to my marquee selection tool. Um, once I have my marquee selection tool active, I'm going to click this button right here, the subtract from selection tool. Doink. And I can click pretty much anywhere off to the side top left or top right of the image. I'm going to click up about here and I'm going to click and drag down until I get to where I think the edge of the table should be. So probably right about there and I'm going to release and it will subtract that from the selection I made for my black background. And now if I click the layer mask button, just like magic, it's just dropped it down to what should fit into that spot. And so when I come back with my blender tool, that'll be even easier. All right, next I'll click on my orb subject. And very quickly again, I am going to, I'm going to zoom in on this one. So I'm going to hit command or control plus, depending on what operating system you're on, to zoom in a little bit. Then I'm going to change my view by holding down the space bar and clicking and dragging. And I'm just going to draw, you know, real quick in where I think the orb about should be, you know, about there. Now I don't have, you know, a circle down here to do that cheat selection from again. I'm going to zoom out, command or control minus. Um, so how do I get this to be a circle? So underneath that rectangular marquee, if I click and hold, I get the elliptical marquee tool. And if I click on where I think the center of the circle should be, so click and hold, and then hit the option and shift key and drag out, you'll get a perfect circle centered. My screen jumped a little bit right there, so I'll need to redo this. It was my uh, backup system starting. So option, shift, and I'm gonna click in the center of this and I get, you know, a nice little circle. And you know, probably about like that. And then release. And I'll click that uh, masking tool again. And just like magic, I've got a perfect circle in there. So now I can edit and paint on each one of those separately from the rest without any issue. So like now I would come back in with a darker brush. So I'll grab that sampling tool again. You know, we got a nice little dark curl right here. So I'll grab a nice dark tone, grab a brush. I'm gonna make it a little bit smaller. So I right click to get a smaller brush. Oh, I'm painting on the layer mask. Did you catch that mistake? So I'm gonna hit Command Z to undo. I could also click up here back up to where I added that layer mask. I need to make my layer active rather than my mask. Um, that's a mistake that a lot of students make um, when they first get used to this program is they'll have the wrong part, they'll have the wrong, they'll have the layer mask active rather than the layer. So you know, I'll just paint that in and notice I can paint over here all I want and it doesn't matter. And curl this around a little bit there and curl this around a little bit right there. To get a really realistic looking sphere once you start blending is going to require when you look at this sphere to understand that there's really even though there's one light, there's really three light sources. So we see this little dot right there, that's our specular highlight from our direct light hitting our sphere, which creates this light on here and it pumps out that shadow, a little bit of highlights right there. But if you look at it really closely, you'll notice that there's a highlight coming up here along the bottom of the sphere, and that's our reflected light coming up off the table. And so if we don't add in that reflected light, we lose a lot of three-dimensionality. And then we have our fourth light source, which is ambient light, which in this case is very dark. But that's gonna dictate how much detail there is in these shadow areas. And again, if you ignore that ambient light, you lose three dimensionality. So understanding that there's really three light sources, even though there's only one actual light, can really help you create a more realistic looking sphere. So this is where I would come back over to um, my mixer brush and I could start with my Kyle's blender again if I wanted or I could pick oh, I don't know whichever one of these gives you a giggle so we can click on this 25 right here and I can start adding in 
uh, more tones to help add in those graduations. Like I need a little bit of a darker one in here. Get a little bit bigger than that. Grab Mr. Eyedropper and uh, right about there. Grab my mixer brush again. And you know, I can start blocking in, oops, I have to turn on load brush. And I can start blocking in some more darker tones. And you know what, wet heavy mix isn't doing it for me. So why don't we do moist so it'll only mix in a little bit. And you know, I can start blending in some more of this shadow. And then, you know, I'm not gonna have quite, I'm not gonna have time to go through and fully mix this guy for you guys, which is why I gave you that PSD for you guys to refer to. But after I get along there, this is where I come back with my Kyle's mixer brush and I can real quick start shading in and mixing in these edges to get, you know, a nice realistic sphere. Um, also in that example is, you know, what, what, you know, without too much effort, you can get one of these guys uh, to look like. So even though this guy's not really ready, if we wanted to export this guy and have it available to, you know, send to people on the internet or print off, we need to talk about what file format and what way we want this saved. So like if I want to be able to continue to edit and paint on this easily, I want to save this as a PSD. So I'll come up to file and I'll come down to save as. And it'll, it'll ask you this junk. Um, unless you're feeling masochistic, I would never use the cloud. So I'm going to say don't show again. And I would like to save this to my computer. And, you know, save it wherever you want. The default file format is going to be Photoshop and you want layers turned on and you want profile turned on. So you'll save it. I'm not going to because I don't need to. Um, and that'll give you a file that you can open and close and return to to continue to edit, which is, you know, <laughs> important. Um, other file formats that you guys will care about is JPEG. So if I'm going to send this to my, you know, Aunt Jane or my mom or my friend or cousin or whatever, I'm going to send this as a JPEG. And the reason why I'll send it to a JPEG is because it's compatible with everyone and it's going to be a fa small, faller, si smaller file size and it plays nice with everyone. Um, for low end printing or most, most printing, JPEG will also be the file format that you'll want to send them. So like you can send them this JPEG and they can print it. So like if you're gonna use Amazon prints or Costco prints or whatever, JPEG it. Um, if you're sending it to a high end printer, you'll want to use the magic of TIFF. And TIFF will keep, um, if you did it in 16 bits, it will keep that extra color depth. Um, and it'll just be a bigger, chunkier, bigger, juicier file from a printer to handle. So like if you're gonna pay somebody to print it nicely, so like Rockbrook or Hamilton Color Lab or whomever, um, a TIFF would be the ideal file format. All right, so we've got a few minutes left. I'm gonna go over a couple other tools as I keep going. This is gonna be your guys' last chance to, an to get questions answered. So make sure you throw them into chat now if you wanna see them answered. All right, so a tool that we haven't looked at um, is, you know, if we're not gonna use that mixer brush, we can also use the smudge tool. And what's nice about the smudge tool is that it cuts out all of these controls. It's much simpler. So I can click on smudge. I have normal mode. Um, you can grab one of these other fancier ones if you wanna just like blend color, or if you wanna just blend brightness. Um, and then I've got strength, how much it's going to mix. And then I can pick any of these other brush shapes to do uh, my blending in. So if I want access to a different brush shape um, than what's on Kyle's, this is another way, very simple way that I can do uh, blending uh, rather than having to rely on um, either a wet brush or the mixer brush. Pretty straightforward. Other tool that we should look at is the eraser tool, which is very simply what it sounds like. It's your way of removing stuff um, from your drawing. Uh, yeah, it's your way of removing stuff from your drawing and it gives you these same brush controls. Now over in our brushes, we have an, 
astonishing amount of control over these brushes. Like we've got all these preset ones, which, you know, I would go through and play with these. These are, these are cool things. And they did a really good job building them. Um, and if you want access to even more brushes, but we'll miss that we'll be missing some of the fancier stuff, you can also turn on legacy brushes. So to turn on legacy brushes, you'll click on the drop down menu right about here. And you'll go down to legacy brushes and you have, yes, yes, restore legacy brushes. And you'll have access to a whole nother set of amazing brushes. And you know, they're not gonna have the same power as the newer ones, but they're still fairly interesting. Um, there's a couple in here that you guys won't have because you know, like some of the ones I built or used for um, myself. Um, so if you or like where are my blood brushes and where's my CIB landscape brushes, those are left over from uh, other classes that I've taught. So if those are missing for you, don't don't be wondering why. Um, so that so you can pick these preset brushes, but you also have an astounding amount of control over the shape of your brush over here in the brush settings. So if I pick a brush, so like, you know, just this round brush, um, that's my brush tips shape. And I can change my size of my brush tip shape and it'll preview it down here for us. And I can also start tilting it. So like if I want to narrow out that brush, so like if I was using, you know, a weirder shape, so like uh, this star brush, um, let me make it bigger so it's easier to see. Um, you can see how it starts angling it. So like if you're using a textured brush, like a grass brush, and you need to add in perspective, that can be a really easy way. So like right here is like a generic grass brush, and now I can tilt it away from me or towards me to help add in that perspective. And I can also spin it around. So let's say I'm making fur. This is the way I can take one of these already pre-made fur brushes and spin it around in order to create that edging. Ooh. I can also then, you know, flip the X axis and flip the Y axis. So you have full control over its orientation. Shape dynamics is even cooler. So this is a way of controlling the shape of the brush and its randomness. Let me go back to that circle brush. Just it'll be a little bit easier for us to see. So shape. And you know what, let's even space it out. So I'm just drag out this spacing. And it's like, how often does it drop down this brush mark? So it's not necessarily continuous. So shape dynamics randomizes the size. You can randomize the diameter depending on, and that's gonna matter depending on what kind of brush you're using. Angle jitter um, to randomize what angle it's at. In this case, it's circular. So uh, let's grab you. Um, when you change your angle jitter, it will, let me space it out again, and make you big. Um, angle jitter will spin it around and then roundness jitter will uh, do that tilting. So it's a way of where if you're gonna have to use like that grass brush to make fake grass, it can randomize it a little bit um, in terms of shape. Same thing with scattering, you can randomize um, the placement of it. So like if I drop down the spacing, it's a little bit easier to see the amount of scattering and also the count. So you can increase the number of times that it's dropping in that scattering. And then you can even randomize that count. So these are ways of creating special effects um, using our brushes. Similarly, you can also come down to transfer and we have something called opacity and flow. So if you're really into oil painting and let's say you want to do a glazing, so let's grab um, you know, a color so we can see it, RGB red. And I turn on uh, opacity jitter and you know, let's pick a more normal looking brush. Opacity jitter on. Now when I paint over it, it will randomize opacity. And what opacity is, I'm on uh, I'm on the eraser. I was like, why is that coming out black? It will randomize the opacity. And what opacity is, is how transparent the brush is. Oh, it's not giving it to me now. You gotta pick a, I gotta do that with the regular brush. There we go. Capacity, drop it down. And so you can see I get a semi-transparent red that allows me to see detail through it. And if I turn the opacity down, I get a less transparent red. And if I turn it up, I get a much you know, less transparent red. So it's a way of faking glazing in uh, Photoshop and transfer allows me to randomize that. Let me make an empty layer. Oops. So it's easier to see this as it goes. Um, and it randomizes uh, that opacity. Randomize. 
so you can see like it randomly adds in some levels of transparency. Um, brush pose. So this is as if you were trying to angle your brush and some fancier uh, tablets can actually you can control the angle with uh, the pen, which is pretty cool. Um, noise adds in as if there is image noise. Like if you're trying to fake uh, shadow details in a photograph, which are going to be noisy, you can pre-build in that noise. Wet edges is exactly what it sounds like. It create, helps create the illusion that the edges of it are wet. So as if it was like a shaped surface. Um, build up allows it to, uh, you know, change its opacity by building up on top of each other. So it's like a manual control for that spray thing. And then protect texture. If there's a texture underneath there, it will try to maintain it while, you know, doing what you're asking it to do. Um, reset. <laughs> and come back up to brush dynamics, brush shape, there we go. So that is a quick rundown of how you can paint in Photoshop. Does anyone have any questions? Otherwise, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up for the night. And the questions need to be posted. Let me see if there's any posted in the webinar chat. Otherwise, I will uh, miss them with how my screen is set up. You know, while we're waiting, we might as well do a little bit more blending. So I'll come back into wet blending. I'm going to grab that wet blender brush, right click to make it a little bit bigger, and you know, start drawing my little circles. And again, like when I'm drawing this painting in, I'm, I'm looking here, and I want to mimic, you know, the, the curvature and the shape. So I'm pretty off down here, so I need to bring in more light tones and move that down. It's like maybe this is where like a regular smudge brush could be very useful. Um, I don't know what it is offhand, but if there is a maximum number of layers, it's probably like in the hundreds. Um, once you start getting past, you know, like 15, 20 layers, unless you've got a pretty beefy computer, um, Photoshop's going to start getting mad at you. Um, but if you do have a lot of layers, there's an organizational trick that can make it quite a bit easier. Um, so let's say I was ready to keep this. I could select all three of these layers. So I've got my orb subject layer, hold down the shift key and grab foreground and background. I can click this little, uh, folder icon to put them all into a folder and label this my painting. And then same thing with these rectangles. I can grab both of these, put them in their own folder, and label this my uh, grayscale. And so like magic, it's much cleaner and easier for me to see, and I can also turn them off now based on that grouping. All right, well, unless there's any other questions, I think that will be it for the night. Um, thank you all very much for coming, and uh, have a good time painting. It's magical. Uh, is there another like continuing Photoshop class for the Illustrator webinar coming up? Not that we have currently in the talks, but um, I'll think about I'll think about doing one in color and see if that makes more sense. All right. Anyway, have a good night. <laughs>